Well, what a way to start us off, a little Beethoven sonata. Thank you, Tim. We will now have our call to worship today, which will be brought to us by our extraordinary, very dear choir as a choral call to worship this morning. Transfiguration Sunday. Also, we are journeying through Black History Month and combining those two, we'll lift up the Transfiguration story about light, but we also have this marvelous quote by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. about light. And it says that darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. And hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. Amen. And now we're ready for our first hymn of the morning, Immortal, Invisible God, Only Wise. Hymn number 319, 319 in your hymnals. I invite you to stand if you are able and if you would like to. Hymn number 319, Immortal, Invisible 
God only wise, let us lift up our voices together, church. <laughs> remain standing for a word of prayer. Immortal, invisible God, we invite you into the space, the expansiveness of your nature, the cosmic creator of the universe. We invite you to somehow fit yourself into these four walls as that same cosmic expansive love has fit itself within the chambers of our hearts. Lord, you are welcome in this place. Walk up and down these aisles, come by the choir loft, head up to the balcony, and don't forget this pulpit. We crave a divine touch from you a divine spark that, that would remind us that you are always near to us, even when we can't feel it, and perhaps especially when we can't feel it. As the light of your love radiates from us, may it brighten the path of all beside. We pray for your presence to be with us in the manner that our Lord Jesus taught us to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. You guys sound great. Thank you. Please be seated.
On mornings like this, I want to join the choir. I, I'm telling you, too bad I have other stuff to do around here. <laughs> yes, and now we have a very special moment in our service where we talk to our little friends, our younger friends, our precious young folks. If y'all come on down and let's give them a hand as they make their way forward. Yes, yes, yes. We're always honored by your presence, friends. And this morning, our children's message will be brought by none other than Mr. Peter Straub. Take it away, brother. For those of you who were not able, and most of you were not able to see Corellis during the anthem, and when I pulled my face out of the music, I looked over to see him. He had a grin that extended past his face. <laughs> Good morning. Oh, that was pathetic. Good morning. That's better. Now, it's wonderful to see you, but I do want to ask you one very important thing first. Now, Sunday, I know, is Corellis' favorite day. Why is it Corellis' favorite day? Anyo? He gets to see everyone. <laughs> so that's his favorite day. But there's another favorite day coming up Wednesday that you are not supposed to forget. What is Wednesday? What's Wednesday? Valentine's Day. So I will give you a hint. There are people that you know who are older than you who really would love to have you say I love you on that day. It's a special, special day. So just let you know, in the old phrase, if mama ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. <laughs> it's good to see you. It is really good to see you. And I, last week, when Corellis was sharing, he showed some pictures at the beginning. What was he showing pictures of? I'm not asking which ones, but what was he showing pictures of last, last week? Did anybody remember? What was he showing pictures? Different fruits. He would show pictures of fruits, and then he would have you spell them, and he would try to spell them up on the board. Yeah. Yes, he was having difficulty with that. <laughs> he was, and his handwriting was a bit suspect. But we aren't going to talk about that. But at the second part, he was asking not about what kind of fruit, but fruits of some other place. Well, the fruit of what? The fruit of the Spirit. So what I did was I... I, these are the fruits that he identified, or you identified, last week, and I think you can probably read these better than what he did. In the, fru in the fruit of joy, in our hearts of joy, and peace, and kindness, and faithfulness, and gentleness. Did I get that wrong? Probably did, that's okay. Anyway, what he also did was in those fruits is hidden. And then he did something like this. And what was hidden is not quite so hidden, but I figured, let's make it easy. Yes. <laughs> so what was, what was Corellis telling you last week? In the fruits, if you want the fruit of the Spirit, or want to find fruits of the Spirit, where do you look? Look for Jesus. Now, that's, that's what I got out of last week. And once you see it now, it's hard to miss. If I put the other paper up, you go, oh yeah, and, and some of you were doing that. We're saying, oh, I can, I can see it, because you knew from last week. But this, once you see it, it's like having those secret pictures when you see things and you can't see it until it goes, oh, here it is. And then once you see it, you can't not see it. Okay? So that's, that's kind of the message here. Now, when you get older, you will find that sometimes hide in plain sight. When you are looking for something and it's just right there in front of you. How many of my friends out there have had that 
at least once a day, if not at least once an hour. And it's crazy. Yeah, where are my glasses? Well, you owe them. Yeah. They're on your head. Well, that's, but that, or on my face, or, and it's awful. But see, when we remember, the lesson here is, is Jesus hiding in plain sight? Where do you have to look? Anywhere. We don't have to be looking anywhere. We play the game hide and seek, which when I grew up in our neighborhood, that was a wonderful game. You know, we play hide and seek. But if you couldn't find people, does anybody remember what we call, what we yelled when Ollie Ollie in free? That's when if you were in and you couldn't find somebody, you yelled Ollie Ollie in free. Do we have to yell that for Jesus? Because even though he, he's there, all we have to do is look. So what I want you to do today, you don't have to look far, do you? And Haley, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go out on a limb here. Right now, I'm seeing him. And you're seeing him. Because the love that's between us, when we look at each other, and I look at any of my church family out there, Look at my church family up here. When we're looking at each other, in one way, who are we looking at? We're looking at the love of Jesus. The fruit of the Spirit is with us. He's not hiding. He's right with us. So as we head to Valentine's Day, let's bow our heads. <laughs> Heavenly Father, sometimes in our lives, things can seem to hide from us. But... We're the ones who are getting in the way when that happens, especially when we look for your son Jesus because he is all around and he is between us and he is with us. And we thank you for that. Amen. 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 And we wave to all of our friends. Yes. 86 four, 86 four, eight, six. I invite you to stand if you are able and if you would like to. Hymn number 486, open my eyes that I may see. Let us lift up our voices together. Please be seated. We now will turn to our scripture for this morning from the Gospel of Mark, and we're delighted to have our beloved deacon, Miss Ann Pollander, to lead us through it. 
All right. The reading this morning is found on page 820 in your Bible. It's Mark 9, verses 2 through 9. And I'll start with <coughs> verse 2, and you read the, the odd ones, and then we'll continue and read the last one together. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain apart by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, who were talking with Jesus. And Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say, for they were terrified. Suddenly, when they looked around, they saw no one with them anymore, but only Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, he ordered them to tell no one about what they had seen until after the Son of Man had risen from the dead. Amen. Thank you, Anne, and thank you, church. Church, that was the gospel of the Lord, and we say... Thanks be to God. <clears throat> Before we get started, I <clears throat> want to recognize Dominique and family, Glenn's family, who have graced us with their presence again. We love seeing y'all. Welcome and good morning. <clears throat> We've now come to the preaching hour, that sacred Kairos moment where we knock on the pearly gates of heaven and beckon our God to come down. <clears throat> Will you pray with me? In the words of Barbara Brown Taylor, Come, Holy Ghost, our souls inspire, enlighten us, with your celestial fire. For if you are not with us, then nothing else matters. And if you are with us, then nothing else matters. Be with us, Lord, we plead and we pray. Amen. <laughs> As many of you know, I was back in New York City this past week to celebrate my birthday. And while some of you confessed you were worried I wouldn't come back, <laughs> that has been dispelled. But it's my birthday week. This is the dawning of the age of Aquarius. The age of Aquarius. Aquarius. Aquarius! Okay, all right. <laughs> and as I was preparing to come back home, I was telling my New York friends, who still find this to be a strange and mystical journey, I was telling them all the things I loved about my new home, all of the wonders of this Green Mountain paradise. I started with the church, of course. You all, beloved, are the first thing I mention. And then I told them about the day when the leaves popped. And I do understand it wasn't as good as some other years, but as a Floridian where the leaves don't change at all. And I learned a, a sort of aha moment. You know, they're called the Green Mountains, not because the mountains themselves are green. I was explaining to them, but because the trees on the mountains are green. And so when the trees on the mountains change color, it does look like the mountains themselves have changed color. And I described to them how I almost swerved going down US 17, watching the burgundy and the gold 
I told them how when the snow falls and, and the leaves are gone and you would think that the trees would be barren and in stick season they are, but when it snows and the snow lines each and every branch of the tree. And how mesmerizing that is for me. I told them about Zeno Mountain Farm and when I went to, uh, as Jan Buker's date and... <laughs> They did this amazing Annie production, and I turn around, and Maggie Gyllenhaal, A-list celebrity, is sitting behind me, and Peter Skarsgård, her husband, and, and the, uh, the a Bond woman, Anna de Armas, walks on stage in this barn in the middle of nowhere in Lincoln, Vermont. I tell them that I've seen more celebrities here than in New York City. I told them about the peace ray, uh, the, uh, the sun ray peace village and the elders gathering where when I came up this summer, they invited me and that converged were spiritual leaders from all over the world, Buddhist practitioners and Native American elders. And in this tiny town, this preacher comes and is now in an international faith community. I told them how I've now been, re I've received an invitation from Sun Ray to be a speaker at that very same gathering this summer. I told them about Meta Earth. I don't fully understand Meta Earth, but I told them about it. And then I told them about all the things I'm looking forward to, the smell of sugaring season as the faint smell of sweetness perfumes the air, the lush and aggressive return of the green, the verdant green in the summer. I'm excited about the solar eclipse where Vermont will feature some of the longest blackout. I told them about so many wonderful things. I even told them about this thing I only learned recently about the monarch butterfly, the official state butterfly of Vermont. First proposed by a fifth grade class at the Cornwall Elementary School, the Vermont General Assembly declared the monarch as the official state butterfly on July 1st, 1987. And they asked, why? <laughs> what is that all about? And I only recently learned I was having dinner with my neighbors, Allison and Robert, and they told me that one of our mutual friends was in Mexico to see the monarch butterflies. And I learned the amazing story of how our monarchs have an extraordinary migration patterns, and that for many monarchs, their migration journey starts, of all places, in Vermont and that they fly as far south as Mexico. From Vermont to Mexico, some 2,341 miles, and I thought there's no way when I first heard this. That's impossible from Vermont to Mexico. I mean, butterflies don't even live that long. <laughs> they live for like 30 seconds or maybe a couple days at most. There's no way they can fly to another country. And then I learned that it may not be the same butterfly. There are generations of butterfly that make that migratory journey, but that for many of them it starts in this green mountain paradise. Not believing it, I looked it up, and, and there's this practice of tagging butterflies and recovering them. And there have been some butterflies that were tagged in Plainfield and Rutland and Essex, Essex Junction that were then recovered, dead, but recovered in El Rosario, Mexico. That's amazing. Butterfly. What mystical creatures. And you may be wondering, this has been fun and all, Pastor, but what's with all this talk about butterflies? Well, I'm so glad you asked. I hope you've learned by now that there is a method to my madness. Not always, but most of the time. Today is Transfiguration Sunday. And it's the last Sunday that moves us out of the season of Epiphany to the season of Lent. And it's, it's that most fantastical, mystical story 
told in all three of the synoptic gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. It's the story you read this morning of Jesus going up to the top of the mountain with just a few disciples and is transfigured. Let's take a closer look at the text. It says, six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain apart by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. And his clothes became dazzling bright, such as no one on earth could brighten them. And and then there appeared Elijah and Moses who were talking with Jesus. And Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it's good for us to be here. Let's set up these tents, one for Moses, one for Elijah, and one for you. And they did not know what to say, for they were terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, And from the cloud there came a voice. This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. And suddenly when they looked around, they they, they saw no one there anymore, but only Jesus. What a fantastical story. The word translated as transfigured is the Greek word metamorpho, metamorpho, and it might be reminding you of an English word, which is good, and it means to change into another form, but church, it's not just a slight mutation, it's not just a small shift. It means more a complete transformation from one thing into another. And the best English word we have for this is metamorphosis. Metamorphosis. And one of the best natural examples of this kind of of mystical, radical change, this kind of metamorphosis in nature, it's the butterfly. The butterfly. It's miraculous when you think about it. It's amazing how... God can use nature to help us explain the deeper mysteries of the universe. And in a state like Vermont, that is on most vivid display. I know we learned as kids how caterpillars become butterflies. And perhaps it only elicited some childlike wonder for us at that stage in our lives. But let's return to it as Adults, let's sit with this metamorphosis this morning. I want you to listen closely as we return to it as adults, because I think, I think this butterfly metamorphosis, this transfiguration, is a stunning portrait of what a spiritual journey should be. I think the natural process of a caterpillar becoming a butterfly is a striking example of what a person's journey of faith should look like. And I want you to listen carefully and see if you can detect how this mystical, natural process might encapsulate something about what it means to journey with God. Think about what happens. As children, many of us learn about this wondrous process. The story usually begins with a very hungry caterpillar hatching from an egg. And the caterpillar, or what is more scientifically termed as larva, stuffs itself with leaves And it grows plumper and longer through a series of molts in which it sheds its skin. 
And one day, the caterpillar stops eating, hangs upside down from a twig or leaf, and spins itself into a silky cocoon. Or it molts into a shiny chrysalis. And within its protective casing, the caterpillar radically transforms its body, eventually emerging as a butterfly or a moth. But what does that radical transformation entail? How does a caterpillar rearrange itself into a butterfly? What happens inside the cocoon? What happens inside the chrysalis? Well, first, church, the caterpillar digests itself. <laughs> Hang in there with me, church. <laughs> We're going to walk through this step by step. First, the caterpillar digests itself releasing enzymes to dissolve all of its tissues. And if you were to cut open a cocoon or chrysalis at just the right time, caterpillar soup would ooze out. But the contents of the pupa are not entirely an amorphous, shapeless, soupy mess. Certain highly organized groups of cells known as imaginal discs, survive the digestion process. Y'all with me still? And before hatching, when a caterpillar is still developing inside its egg, it grows an imaginal disc for each of the adult body parts it will need as a mature butterfly. There are special discs for its eyes. There are special discs for its wings and its legs. And in some species, these imaginal discs <clears throat> remain dormant throughout the caterpillar's life. But in other species, the discs began to take the shape of an adult body part even before the caterpillar forms a chrysalis or cocoon. Some caterpillars walk around with tiny rudimentary wings tucked inside their bodies, although you would barely be able to see them with the naked eye. Everything that that butterfly needs to be a butterfly is already in the DNA of the caterpillar. Is this starting to sound like a sermon, church? Once a caterpillar has disintegrated all of the tissues except for the imaginal discs, those discs use the protein-rich soup all around them to fuel the rapid cell division required to form the wings, the antennae, the legs, the eyes, and all the other features of the adult butterfly. The imaginal disc for example, it might only begin with 50 cells. But by the end of the metamorphosis period, those 50 have turned into 50,000 cells. And what is the agent of change in the biblical text this morning? The Holy Spirit is at work and what is the description of the identity of Jesus that God, God's self, gives? If, if Jesus is undergoing metamorphosis, if he's being transfigured, then there is an agent that's driving that process. And I submit that we look at verse 7 to identify what the agent of metamorphosis might be. In verse 7 it says, Then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud there came a voice, this is my son, the beloved. By the way, if there's some big point you think I'm making and the sermon title has not yet surfaced. <laughs> the beloved. Think 
think about that. And this is the second time that God has chosen to describe Jesus this way. First at his baptism. Do you remember? When the skies part and the dove descends and and God says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Now this is a separate moment where the audible voice of Almighty God, think about that. Peter and James and John heard with their human ears the tone and tenor of the voice of God. And when God chooses to describe Jesus, to assign a title to Jesus, he doesn't say, this is the king. He doesn't say, this is the Savior, listen to him. This is the sacrificial lamb, listen to him. What does God choose to encapsulate Jesus' identity? He calls him the loved one, the beloved. That word beloved is from the Greek agape, meaning unconditional love. And church, I know that I haven't journeyed on this earth for as long as some of you. Many of you know what age I turned last Thursday. And those that don't, it's impolite to ask. (laughs) But I've lived long enough to know that of all the titles this world, this life can offer, beloved, being deeply and truly loved, is all there is. God is love. And hear this preacher say that love is all there is. Not listen to the conqueror. Not listen to to the, the, the powerful. Listen to my son, the beloved, the loved one. The highest title that not only this world can offer, but even the heavenly world, is to be loved relentlessly by God, God's self. And like the caterpillar, we are born with all the ingredients to be this butterfly. Each and every one of us, exactly as we are, were created in the image and the likeness of God. We are all reflections of divine love, but we were also born with, you might say, a carnal nature. The ability to not choose to reflect divine love in every case, despite it being our true nature. And like the caterpillar, the journey of faith is to break down or dissolve all the things that are not like God. Let those break down in this messy soup of life. We can let those things that are not centered in love and peace and joy and grace and mercy and kindness, we can let those things break down and then what remains are the precious beautiful cells to make the butterfly. God's love can melt down that temper and God's love can melt down that hate and that bitterness and that selfishness God's love is the most powerful agent of metamorphosis in all creation. There are at least two amazing things that butterflies can do that caterpillars can't. Most caterpillars are either green or brown on their body, with sometimes accents of other colors to signal poison and danger to their predators so they don't get eaten. But butterflies, (laughs) butterflies can feature some of the most fantastical colors that are just breathtaking. And you may have had some cute qualities here and there before your life was centered around God's love. 
But friend, I'll tell you, when you start to live your life as an ambassador of God's love, when your actions flow from your deep love of God and your deep love of neighbor, you may have been cute before, but your colors of love will shine so bright so as to make the rainbow blush with envy. And then... After you undergo metamorphosis with God's love, you won't have to crawl around this earth anymore. You wouldn't have to be bound to the earth looking for your next snack. You wouldn't have to be bound by the trappings of this world and the trappings of this earth, by the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. You won't be bound by the values and priorities of this earth. Your life won't have to be ruled by the logic of this world, but with the love of God at your back. Oh, then, baby, you can fly. Fly away. You can slip the surly bonds of earth and fly closer and closer to the creator. Get closer and closer to the bright and morning star, the rose of Sharon, the fairest of 10,000. Get closer and closer to that dazzling brightness that this world's bleeding each cannot attain with God's love at your core my beloved you can soar carrying a beautiful banner for God's love from sea to shining sea from Vermont to Mexico from north to south east and west from this life into the next amen, amen. Let us consider the butterfly. Amen. Now, friends, we will take a moment of holy silence, borrowing from the tradition of our Quaker friends. As the preached word of God sits with you, we shall hold sacred silence, being aware of the power of being joined together as one body. And with that, church, we shall turn to our last hymn of the service. This is an insert uh, that Judy is lovingly prepared. By the way, also, Judy was the inspiration for these beautiful hymns this morning, including one of my favorite, Shine, Jesus, Shine, and the insert. Uh, please stand if you are able and if you'd like to as we close out the service with this last hymn, Shine. Jesus, shine, let us lift up our voices together.
beloved, please remain standing. Woo! For these words of benediction. May you let the light inside of you shine. May you let God's relentless love be the agent of change in your life, be the agent of metamorphosis in your life. And as we journey together, friends, may the road rise to meet you. And may the wind blow at your back, and may the sun shine warmly on your face, and may the rains fall softly on your fields. And until we meet again, may our God hold you in the very palm of her very hand. Go in peace not only being transformed by love, but loving others so that they might transform. Go in peace to love and serve, beloved. Amen.